this is another Drum Wise Meet, and I'm here with Jace from Bullet for My Valentine. Hi, how you doing? What bands did you listen to when you were growing up, and what inspired your drumming? And also, who do you think is your all-time favourite drummer, if you could pick one? Well, when I was growing up, you know, I was, I was brought up on a diet of Black Sabbath and Fleetwood Mac by my folks. Because um, my dad's a musician, he plays guitar, my two brothers play guitar. And then, you know, it's Van Halen, um, Iron Maiden. And then I got into drumming when I was about 11. Uh, best friend at school played drums and yeah those drummers inspired me you know um, Alex Van Halen and Lars Ulrich and then Slayer came along and Dave Lombardo was a huge influence because I realized he was left-handed on a right-handed kit which is the same as me and um, yeah that was good speed training playing along to Slayer uh, much to the dismay of my neighbors <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that's my um, sort of influences really. And then you know, I got more into um, electronic music, Nine Inch Nails, and became oddly enough obsessed with playing to a click uh, when I was 16 or 17. And I wanted to be in a band that used samples, and um, I got into sequencing, writing music with electronic sounds, and that's why I was into playing to a click because I could see how drums and samples can interleave and how you can create hybrid patterns that's the key word now isn't it hybrid but in actual fact you know it hybrid's been going on for since the 80s um it's nothing new you know marrying drums and electronic sounds together you look at bands like new order and killing joke you know they were they were groundbreaking at the time and they've influenced nine inch nails and nirvana and all those other big bands what would you say is the highlight of your career so far Oh, well, that's a, a tricky one, but um, there's a few highlights. I think one of them was um, playing um, Wembley Arena with Bullet. Um, it was just, you know, was incredibly nervous beforehand because I was asked to step in at really short notice and didn't have any rehearsals with the band. And in fact, those the, the gigs on that run, there was um, the MEN Arena in Manchester, which was amazing. and. Yeah, those they were really standout moments, you know, and um, the festival season in Europe, just, you can't beat it. You've got festivals like Rock and Ring, Grass Pop, and you're playing to like 80,000 people. And you just can't get your head around it because they just stretch back to the horizon, you know, and it's just, uh, it's nerve wracking, but in a good way. And you then realize it's being streamed live. <laughs> as well and there's cameras everywhere but uh you know to to come through that and you know think to yourself yeah that was a good gig you know that's their proper highlights really when you first get a gig with a new artist how are you expected to learn the songs would they give them to you in, in sheet music and say right here you go jace here are the songs please learn all of these or are you just expected to learn them off spotify um and then once you've learned them how many rehearsals would you be given with the band before you actually play the first show? <laughs> well, what I've learned is that every band is different. Bands are just unique organic life forms. <laughs> so for instance, uh, you know, way back in the day with, with Pitch Shifter, um, it was like, here's a demo of the songs, learn these get into a room, play them till I know them and turn up with the band and have four rehearsals and there you go, all done, or you know, for recording an album. Um, obviously with Bullet it was completely different because it was a short notice thing, it was two songs, two, uh, sorry, two days to get ready for 17 songs. Um, and for that, you know, I really had to just live, eat, breathe drums for 48 hours. So it was a case of writing some cheat sheets of you know the song structures, finding something that was uh, that was common through throughout the songs. I could group like uh, you know songs in groups of four because they were similar tempos, they had similar structures. And the way I looked at it was you know once I've learnt a third of the song, then I've pretty much got it all. It's just a bridge section to sort out, and so it's making it easier mentally 
um, you know, trying to forget about the fact you're going to be playing in front of 10,000 people in three days' time. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, so what I eventually did is uh, just I filmed myself doing it because I needed a, like a, a false set of eyes on me that created a weird bit of pressure. And I challenged myself to get it perfect to the camera because uh, I thought if I could do that and then send it to the guys, that would put their mind at rest to show them that I can perform it. So I did that and that was good. That sharpens your focus, I think, when you're getting ready. Um, and then when I was eventually ready to um, to go and you know, join them on the first gig, I had just one sheet of paper with the set list and, um, you know, just one or two things that were that I had to remember for the song. And there were some hair raising moments, you know, where there was one song, I forgot how it started in, in the middle of the gig and I had a mental block and um, the the click started and I wasn't in control of the click the monitor man was controlling it and the count came in and I was like oh my god what am I gonna do and I just hit a bass drum and a cymbal and luckily that's how it started and then it all came back so like, oh, I've you know, totally had that before that's a, oh. that's a really scary situation to be in isn't it it's like hmm. absolute panic inside yeah it's, it's just your life flashes before your eyes you know in that moment and you, you get the odd moment like that now in gigs where your mind might wonder or sometimes I'm looking at kids in the front row and they're air drumming and I'm like oh that's weird I don't play it like that and then it's put me <laughs> off before you know it I'm like <laughs> the song <laughs> so absolutely it's, it's cool having a massive crowd to play to because I find that if I focus too much on the crowd I forget what I'm doing and it's it's, weird, it's quite hypnotic mm. But you know, that, I mean, that was bullet. That was the way I learned songs for them. And I played with a band called Killing Joke and it was a completely diff different kettle of fish because they're an old school punk band. And um, I was trying to find out what the set list was for this uh, festival. And no one would tell me what the set list was. So I went online, looked at old set lists. I learned about 30 songs, turned up to rehearsals and they were like, we're not doing any of those. I'm like, great, okay. And then, you know, it was a, made a complete fool of myself trying to blag through songs that I didn't know and I uh, was being sworn at and everything. And uh, there, was, there was a few arguments and then it was all fine that, you know, the pressure released and they said, okay, we'll play what what, what you know and we should have told you really. Um, but that was, that was a bit cruel, you know, it was a uh, different experience. And then playing live with those guys as well was unbelievable because they, the structure changes gig to gig, you know, subtly, like the verse might be longer, you have to look at them. And it's a proper band. Like, I'm used to playing to a click where you can keep your head down, not look at anything, and just play your own gig as a drummer. Yeah. Killing joke. Mm. It's a band where you, you've got to look at them in the eyes. They might change something, they might be waiting for you to do something. They're proper vibe merchants. Right. Um, you know, it's amazing. So everything's different. You mm. can't ever get complacent or too relaxed unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> that's great and definitely what you said about the, the cameras like filming yourself that's that's brilliant i'm always telling people to film their practice uh, and stuff so yeah that's that's brilliant so um specifically for bullet here when you're playing uh, bullet gigs are you using much in the way of electronics these days or are there any tracks running um, and are you, in, are you in charge of any of that on stage? Well, no, I've always been in charge of electronics on stage, but with Bullet, I'm not. It's a big operation, you know, and the um, the monitor guy basically presses play. Matt gives him a signal when he's delivering a bit of banter between songs. Um, but we run tracks like there's, there's not much going on at all. There's the odd affected guitar, there's some sub sounds, some really low stuff backing up guitars, low bass synth or whatever. Um, so I have got like a, an SPD one WAV pad that I trigger the occasional boom with, you know, but I, I use that in a drum solo really. And I think if you've got tracks going on with a band, there's not a lot of point in triggering stuff. You're just creating more work for yourself really. Um, a lot of these questions have asked other people, but this one very much is for you. We get a lot of people coming in wanting to start playing double pedal. Um, what would your advice be for someone that's 
that's never played double pedal, double kick before, and they want to start? What would your first bit of advice be for that? Well, the number one bit of advice for playing double pedal is make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. If you play funk or jazz and you think, I want to play double pedal because I see other people doing it, you're not going to get very far because you need, a, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of patience. Um, second thing, and it's, this has occurred to me more and more really in the past 10 years is, if you can get two bass drums, um, just having that kind of uh, stereo field, if you like, of the left bass drum there, the right bass drum there, it just it just uh, helps with the balance, the equilibrium, if you like, of playing double kick. Um, I played double pedal for years, like right footed, and, and it was fine, you know, but I kind of hit a brick wall a long time ago and I had to go back and look at my technique. So I, I switched back to two bass drums because I had a double bass drum kit when I was 15. Um, and I found that it really refined my technique playing two bass drums. Um, it made me think more about my non-dominant leg, my left leg, and I could hear it more. I had that, you know, bass drum beat at a skin contact with the left leg. And now, for instance, when I go out and if I do a clinic and I don't want to take two bass drums in the car, I'll take a left-footed double kick pedal because my non-dominant leg still has that contact with the, the bass drum. My right, my right leg is automatic anyway. It can deal with any, you know, latency or non-contact uh, with, with the bass drum and from the double pedal. So that's fine and, and it works really well actually. Mm. At home, you know, I'll try and, if I'm practicing bullet stuff, I'll practice on the two bass drums, but, and recording so much easier with, with a double pedal. But I think it's really important if you can practice with, um, with two bass drums. If you can get a, a, um, a left-footed double pedal, you've got the added advantage of being able to have your toms lower because there's a gap where the right bass drum is so you can get your rack tom, the deeper one, lower. Yeah. Uh, it looks weird. People have questioned the look of my kit when I'm doing clinics and stuff like, what, what are you doing? It looks like the front. Have you set it up? Like, uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've set it up for me. <laughs> yes, for me, thanks. Yeah. The third most important thing is make sure you can hear what you're doing. Um, so when I play live, in my in-ear monitors, it's a quiet mix. I don't really have any other drums other than the bass drums, and they're quite clicky. Because if I can hear them clicky, it makes me uh, relax more, so I'm not putting in too much effort. If you play bass drums too hard and you're playing fast, you're gonna run out of steam, and you're gonna get, um, it's gonna sound rigid and lumpy. So it's really important to think light when you're playing double kick. That's not to say you will actually play light, You'll play at a normal velocity then because it's an adrenaline adrenaline fueled te technique anyway so you're gonna always get power but if you just have that mindset of playing light you know you don't have to hammer them um, it will make your feet relax more you know your ankles which you'll use for faster speeds ankles and shin mid tempo and then you know more of the thigh for the, the slower tempos and that's important as well, thinking about different parts of the leg for like different gears for different speeds, different tempi of double kick rhythms. Similar to if you're playing rolls, we, we obviously think about your wrists and your and your forearms. It's the same idea, but just with your legs. Well, exactly. And it's logical, isn't it, when you put it like that? But because your legs are out of sight, you know, people just hammer them from the thigh. They don't think about the mechanics of them. Um, they take a lot of warming up your legs sometimes and the arms, you know, like you say, you use your upper arm and the full arm and the wrist for a, a powerful hip and then down to the, the forearm and wrist for a backbeat whip, wrist for faster um, figures and then fingers for even more subtle faster stuff. With this style of uh, drumming, I'm not talking about you specifically, but you might know this. When it comes to listening to the, an actual record, I imagine some producers will uh, trigger the bass drums or they'll replace the bass drums on the recording. Are, are you, do you do you know if that is the case with some bands? With every band, um, because producers can do it now effortlessly, you know, and it's um, 
you know, I produce music myself. And when I produce my own drums, I try and, I think if you use two mics correctly, you don't really have to trigger um, the kick drum if you've got two mics on the kick drum and if it's played properly as well. I, I personally, I love the, the feel and the nuances of, of double kick. Um, but, you know, if you've got double kick patterns being played at super fast speeds with guitars over the top that are conflicting with the frequency of the double kick, then you're going to have to trigger them to make it cut through and sound powerful. Um, now that happens a lot on records. It happens not just in metal, in pop, indie music, rock, you name it. Triggers are there to, used in the correct way, they can augment the sound, make it sound fatter, nicer, and it's it's great, you know? Um, so albums, recording is totally different to live. Live, you know, I've, I've never used triggers live it's not for me i don't like i mean bullet the you know the kick speed for a for a constant roll they get up to about 205 bpm 210 that's fast enough for me <laughs> it's fast no, enough for most people i think <laughs> bursts of speed you know where you know, it might be playing like for maybe 220 230 but that's not a constant flow and you know it works for me live not playing not having triggers but obviously if you're playing 240 plus which uh, there are some drummers out there it's a completely different ball game and um the pedal set up differently it's all about speed and uh you know i'm there's probably some superhuman drummers that don't use triggers at that speed live but i know most of them do and it's fine because it works for that kind of music yeah um, but um, yeah, but I think if you're playing in a band where you've got such a mix of styles, like with Bullet, there's slow songs, there's fast songs, there's mid-tempo songs, it, it triggers are a nightmare because you'll be re-triggering stuff, it's hard to get the settings right and yeah, it's, it's more hassle than it's worth it. What sort of person do you think uh, someone needs to be to be successful in the music industry? Uh, you've got to be extremely humble um, because there's so many ups and downs, you know, with social media and Instagram, you know, we're, we're all guilty of it. You only see the good side of life, don't you? You know, and that's what's leading to a lot of problems with people's mental health because they think that, you know, outside their room, their house, their life. Everyone's having a great time and they're not, but so far from the truth. And you, you know, I can't talk. My Instagram is just full of lovely pictures of big crowds and stages. <laughs> but you know, the flip side of the coin of that is when I'm in America for seven weeks, I have a proper stinker of a time, you know, in the middle of the tour, cause I'm missing my family. I might be in the middle of nowhere, the food's rubbish and life sucks and people will say oh you're in a big band how can that be but you know at the end of the day everything has a an opposite and it's not all amazing life just doesn't work like that um and you you just have to learn to be humble and accept things and be content with what you've got in the music industry because if you're not you're always going to be looking at someone else who's maybe a bit hotter at the moment or you know doing slightly better but everyone's looking at each other and you've got to be open-minded willing to learn every day because you're going to get tested and it in an environment on a tour bus that's another important um way to be you know to get on with people and just um give a little accept people's um craziness sometimes because we've all got a bit of a crazy side haven't we <laughs> So when you're in a, a big band, how does it work in terms of how you get paid? <laughs> um, well, there's different ways, there's different levels, you know. Um, I was a session drummer for many, many years, and it would be a case of a manager phoning, asking if I was available, and then saying either how much, or nine times out of 10, they would say, well, we've got this much, and it's never as much as you want. <laughs> mm. So, you know, you have to find a compromise. Um, and then, the, you know, when you're a session player, you talk about 
well, okay, well, there's 20 gigs out of 30 days. Um, and you're kind of gone a bit low on my fee. So how about I won't charge you travel days and you pay me what I want for my fee per show. So there's ways of doing things, you know, that's how it works work for me anyway as a session drummer. Um, you can get put on a retainer sometimes um, in a band where you're paid a wage for a year and you, you won't tour all year, but that's how you're paid, you know. Um, or you can be put on a, a bonus system. It depends on where you are in the band, whether you're a band member, um, where, you know, your, your tour profits will earn a certain amount and then you get a, a cut of that. That's another way of doing it. So there's, there's many different ways of how you get paid in a band. Um, but you should never do anything for nothing. And I hear of stories of um, guys, you know, or girls doing session work and they say, oh, I'll, I'll do it for nothing because I want to get my name out there. But then you're going to be known as that guy or girl that's doing stuff for free. And you're going to be fi you're finding it very difficult to negotiate a wage because we all need money to live. And you need to put value on your skill, you know. And at the same time, it's important not to be greedy as well because a big band has a lot of overheads and you know you have to look at where you are how long have you been with the band who started the band it, it's a proper minefield money is is a nightmare with bands it can cause a lot of problems so what does the future hold for you obviously i know we're in a very strange time right now with the with the virus but what are your plans going forward maybe after this is all gone away well i mean it's just very bizarre, you know. In some ways, the nice thing about it is it forces you to press the pause button on life and look at what's around you and what's important, i.e. family. With myself, you know, um, when I'm not on tour, I'm generally at home anyway. And this year was a you know, quiet year for us, apart from recording later on in the year. Um, so we're lucky in that respect, but yeah, I mean, I at the moment I'm writing music from home and I love doing that. Obviously, with the band, um, we just got to hope that things get relaxed by the end of the year and we can crack on with recording the next album. But um, it's hard to think any further ahead than that because next year, you know, there's going to be a huge backlog of touring. Everyone's going to want to go on tour. Um, festival season a lot of bands make their money during the two months july and august in the summer and that kind of keeps them going for the rest of the year so it could finish off a lot of bands because if they can't get that income the problem with being in a band is you have to keep the ball rolling particularly if you're a younger band and if you can't do that you're going to have to find other ways of keeping yourself out there maybe recording more and doing you know things in bite-sized chunks that's gonna how it's how it's have to that's going to be what it's going to be like if that makes any sense for a lot of bands yeah uh, um, but yeah it's you know we can only think so far ahead Ev everyone we're all in the same boat aren't we so um yeah i'm trying to live each day as it as it comes and enjoy the day to the max really probably the most important question um what's your favorite biscuit <laughs> Oh God, it's, that's worse than saying, what's your favorite drummer or what's your favorite band? Um, I think it would have to be Dark Chocolate Gingers. Wow, we've not had that one. Okay, yeah. that's a new one. We kind of buy a packet every six weeks. They're a proper treat, you know, because when you buy the packet, there's just not enough in there. They're, they're nicely presented in, you know, cellophane cover, so you can see how many of, you know what you're getting. There's probably about nine in a pack, but that's just gone. <laughs> in like five minutes, it's not enough. So, you know, they're, they're, they're the treats biscuit, the sort of uh, everyday staple sort of biscuit would be um, dark chocolate digestive. Okay, yeah. You know, down a level is malted milks with <laughs> Maybe bourbons in the middle. Okay, bourbons in the middle. <laughs> what a malted milk, a bourbon, and then a malted milk. Like oh a God, a biscuit sarnie. Look at that. Well, there we go. 
This There's no idea for you. Do that tomorrow. You've got nothing else to do. Locked on biscuits. <laughs> when you do a, a big show, can you just do a, a quick rundown of how it works? So, in terms of when you arrive, your kit is set on the riser and it's rolled on. You know, if you could just talk us through that and, and about sound check, just just a brief rundown. A day in the life on tour. Well. It normally starts with the bus rolling up in the early hours of the morning to the, the venue. Um, and then, you know, I'll wake up early, I'll go exploring to make the most of the day. The crew load in really early to get everything set up, check the PA. Um, we have a sound check around about four. I'm the only one that turns up to it though. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I don't bother sound checking, especially halfway through a tour because you're on autopilot and you might be out having an adventure somewhere, you know. Mm. Uh, and there might be catering at the venue, so you know, you can have lunch and then dinner later on. You can eat too much on tour, there's even breakfast sometimes. But if you're not careful, you can, you know, you can put on a few pounds. So I, I tend to get up early, go out for breakfast, sightsee, have a little blast around the kit, sound check, and then uh, have some dinner three hours before the show um, yeah then we play and then uh, we're done by about 11 and then you know maybe a beer game of FIFA in the lounge of the tour bus that could go on till three in the morning and then <laughs> and it all starts again <laughs> <laughs> so you so you essentially leave one venue on the bus and then you wake up at the next one um, yeah totally and nice, yeah. when you don't go to a sound check you have to have ultimate faith in your in your drum tech to set everything up, check it, and because then when you walk on stage, that's the first time you've set that kit. Well, see, I'll never ever not check the kit. Um, if I oh, get back to the lace, I won't play the kit because there'll be punters in. Mm. I'll sneak behind the kit because it's got a blanket over it, and I'll check everything then. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah, but I, I just can't risk it, you know, because. Yeah. Yeah. If something's out and I catch a stick under a symbol and it goes, I'm, you can recover from a drop stick, but it's, it's nice not to drop a stick. Yeah, yeah. But I guess you're all marked out on your rug, so that it's just it's pretty much the same every single time it goes out. Yeah, I'll always question stuff though. Is that snare a bit higher today? <laughs> and I've, we measure stuff as well, the perfect height, and we check the angles with an app. And if I think it's out, I'll measure it myself. And really? it's embarrassing when it's not out. <laughs> and the drum tech's like, see, I told you. <laughs> Just checking, all right. That's amazing. You heard it first here that Jace measures the height of his cymbal stands. I think, yeah, it's awfully geeky. What's your best bit of advice for up and coming drummers? Persevere. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, it's a lifelong project. Being a musician is a lifelong project. Um, you know, I mean, it's taken me. It's taken me 30 years to get to where I am. Um, and, you know, I, I was, it's been a steady gradient with some, you know, peaks and troughs all the way. And there's been times over the last 30 years where I felt like jacking it in because it's got so difficult. And then all of a sudden out of the blue, something happens when you don't expect it. So I remember the day I got the phone call from Bullet back in 2010, I had a tax bill that I couldn't afford to pay. <laughs> I had a really crap day. And then this phone call happened out of the blue. And, you know, it, cool stuff happens. So you just have to be positive and persevere and be patient. The three Ps. Mm, I like that. Yeah. yeah, it works. Very good advice. Excellent. Thank and it's um, something that we want to mention as well. So Jace uh, is doing some online lessons. Um, I, yeah. I have actually had lessons with Jace myself and I can thoroughly recommend it. So Jace, just tell us how people can book in with you. Yeah, um, basically just send me an email, jace at jasonbold.com or DM me on Instagram or Facebook. And it's as easy as that, you know, get into a little bit of, um, chat in online and then sort out a date and you're in book in with jace now jace at jasonbold.com that's it 
that's that's where to where to go. So, Jace, thank you so much for spending time talking to us here at Drumwise. It's been a thank privilege you. talking to you, and um, good good luck with everything going forward. You too, mate. Stay safe. <laughs>